Thank you for having me. It is great to be someplace where I can say rat fucked after being on the radio doing Q&As. <laughs> um, well, this has been quite a week already. Um, we saw in the Brexit results last night the impact of an angry, frustrated nationalism. Some of us see that mood reflected right here at home in the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. The night before, we watched angry, frustrated Democrat stages sit in on the floor of the House of Representatives to protest an action on a series of post-Orlando gun control measures, fired up Democrats, energized their base, won social media, and dreamed of gains this November by taking a radical stand on an issue with broad popular support and deep emotional resonance. I want to suggest tonight, however, that the anger and frustration in our politics, the dysfunction and the extremism, the disconnect between a broad popular will and the kinds of action we see coming from Congress and state legislatures springs from a root cause. It's called Red Map, short for Redistricting Majority Project, and it was an audacious and radical plan by the Republicans to redraw our legislative maps so they could govern from the minority. Did it ever live up to its name? The lines the Republicans drew after the 2010 elections ensured Republican control of the House, at least through the 2020 census. No matter how big the Democrats win the White House, leaving sputtering House liberals few options besides this week's sit-in. But the new lines also created so many uncompetitive districts, 400 of the 435, so tilted we barely need to hold the election, that it changed the tone and tenor of the GOP as well, creating the conditions for Donald Trump to walk away with the party. This practice is commonly called gerrymandering. It put many of us to sleep in eighth grade civics. It can be traced all the way back to 1790 and the roots of our republic. It is among the oldest political tricks in the book. The Constitution mandates that all state legislative and congressional districts be redrawn every 10 years, section one, article two, to adjust for population shifts. As long as we've had politicians, they have tried to game the system for their side. But what happened in 2010 was not like any other gerrymander in our history. Let's put it this way. From 1790 all the way to, to 2010, gerrymandering is in its, its horse and buggy era. In 2010, it skipped straight to a rocket ship. It had been a useful, if crude, tool for devious political revenge, incumbent protection, for either party to grab an undeserved seat here or there. What the Republicans execute in 2010 is something we have never seen before. The oldest trick in the book used in a thoroughly modern new way. They used the gerrymander not only as a blunt partisan weapon, but as a way to govern from the minority, and new technology and mapping tools would provide impregnable district lines as their firewall. It was different, historically so, thanks to driven Republican strategists determined to take full advantage of redistricting and cutting edge mapping technologies and demographic tools that made it easier than ever to craft unbeatable GOP majorities and the wave of post Citizens United dark money which helped fund this plan. Red map is the reason why Republicans held the House in 2012 despite almost a million and a half fewer votes. And it's the reason why Republicans have a hammerlock on the House into the next decade, impervious to most any political landslide. We have been, say it with me, rat fucked. <laughs> this is not politics as usual. This is a crisis of democracy, and we can't talk about our broken and extreme politics honestly or with any hope of making this system responsive until we fully come to terms with what happened in 2010 and 2011 right under our noses. This book started when I tried to answer a really simple question. I fundamentally didn't understand how Barack Obama could be reelected in 2012 with a solid electoral a college majority of 332 to 206 a popular vote majority of just under five million, but barely budged the House of Representatives. The Democrats won 25 of 33 Senate seats that November and did gain seven seats in the House, but that only trimmed the Republican majority to 234-201. The House would continue to lead the opposition to the president's policies, frustrating liberals who saw their tactics as obstructionist. Like I just mentioned, if you were to add up the votes in all 435 House elections that year, the Democrats win by 
million. That's not a shabby margin. House Speaker Boehner would claim on election night that Americans had renewed the Republicans' majority. In reality, this was the first time in 40 years since 1972, and just the second time since World War II, that the party that won the most votes did not also take control of the chamber and win the majority of the seats. So what happened? We know the ticket sp splitting has decreased over recent decades. In 2012, it actually fell to a 92-year low. So it wasn't that people voted for a Democratic president and a Republican House as a check on his power. That's when I came across a group called the Republican State Leadership Committee and their plan called Red Map. Their strategy emerges from the Republican doldrums after being routed in 2008. Republicans had lost the popular vote for the White House that night for the fourth time in, fifth, in five elections. They stared at the Democratic supermajority in the Senate, and as they watched Fox News through a fuzzy third martini glow, feared they were staring down a looming demographic nightmare that could render them a minority party for the near future. While some despaired, a, a brilliant strategist named Chris Jankowski, the executive director of that RSLC, had an idea. He saw the seeds for hope and change of his own, and he realizes that the truly important election is not 2008, but in 2010. That's the census year, that's the redistricting year, every line in every state legislature and all 435 congressional districts are about to be redrawn. Jankowski understands that elections in years ending in zero simply mean more than others. They reverberate throughout the decade, and he was determined to make that so. He may not be as well known as other strategists, like his friends Carl Rove and Frank Luntz, or his boss at the RSLC, the former Republican National Committee Chairman Ed Gillespie. He'd spent his career strategizing victories at the state level, and he knew you could get more done for the conservative cause and at a bargain basement price in state elections. This is why he's able to envision a bold national redistricting play that had eluded strategists of both parties even as they gerrymandered for 200 years. Big GOP donors may not feel like a kingmaker or a Koch brother by writing a check to the candidate running in, in Pennsylvania's 130th House District, but Jankowski knew the money would go much, much further there. In 37 of 50 states, the legislature plays the primary role in drawing its own lines. 42 of those states, they play the primary role in drawing congressional lines. Jankowski's strategy becomes so simple and elegant, it's amazing no one had hit on it quite before. And being as how Karl Rove announces the strategy in the Wall Street Journal in March of 2010, it's amazing that the Democrats are unable to play a defense and stop it. The Republican State Leadership Committee strategists decide to target takeovers of as many state legislative chambers as they can in 2010 with an eye to maximizing the number of states where they could have total control, the only seats at the table, when it came to drawing new maps in the following year. Jankowski and Rove knew they could do it. They had to sell Republican donors first on this play. People call us a vast right-wing conspiracy, but we're really a half-assed right-wing conspiracy. Rove told one deep-pocketed Republican gathering, trying to talk them out of money for this, now it's time to get serious. They told their wealthy benefactors the party spent $110 million battling cycle after cycle in just 20 of the competitive House districts over the last decade. For $30 million, they promised, they'd take those districts off the table and draw them safely for the Republicans for the next decade. We weren't selling access anymore, Jankowski told me. We were selling an outcome and an impact on the political system. They spent a million dollars on Ohio State House races, flipping the chamber and giving the Republicans complete control over the redrawing of 132 legislative districts and 16 congressional seats. Another million in Michigan flipped both the House and the Senate there, bringing complete control of 148 legislative districts and 14 more seats. They spent just under a million in Pennsylvania delivering a veto-proof control over redistricting in an another otherwise blue state. 
Red Map delivers everything it promised. Republicans gained some 700 state legislative seats nationwide. By the end of election night 2010, they control two thirds of all legislative chambers in the country. They pressed that demographic advantage big time in 2011, using the most advanced map making technology ever to super glue their gains in place. Email records and depositions show the epic lengths the Republicans went to in 2011 to draw maps with the goal of locking in a decade, at least, of House dominance. In court case after court case, whether in Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida, or Texas, Virginia, or in other states like Ohio, where Freedom of Information Act requests uncovered revealing email exchanges between operatives and map makers, the story just gets scarier for anyone who cares about participatory democracy. In Ohio, Republican strategists barricade themselves into a suite at the Doubletree Hotel and dub it the bunker. They tell no one where they are. Together with strategists from the RNC and Speaker Boehner's political team, devise new lines based on complicated mathematical algorithms. In Wisconsin, operatives tied to Paul Ryan barricade themselves in a law firm across from the Capitol, claim attorney-client privilege for the maps they're drawing, require even Republican incumbents to sign confidentiality agreements before being shown their new districts. In North Carolina, they bring in a master map maker named Tom Hofeller, who treats redistricting like it's espionage and gives colleagues a presentation warning them not to use their email, not to use their computers visible, visible, and not to fire the staff before they're sure the process is done. In Florida, strategists conspired an end run around a new state constitutional amendment mandating nonpartisan redistricting by running a secret shadow redistricting process and funneling maps through phony emails and former interns without their knowledge. What does all this mean in practical terms? Republicans got themselves complete control over the drawing of 193 districts. Democrats had complete control over just 44. You need 218 for control, so that's a pretty good start. More importantly, Democrat, um, a national Public Radio had labeled 70 districts competitive in 2010. After Election Day 2010, the GOP controlled the, the drawing of lines of 47 of those. Red Map takes these seats completely off the table. Move ahead to 2012, you have the first elections run on these new maps, and we see just how effective they are. They provide the firewall that keep the Republicans in power. In Pennsylvania, Democratic House candidates receive 100,000 more votes. Republicans take 13 of the 18 seats. 52% of the vote equals 28% of the seats. In Michigan, House Democrats win 240,000 more votes. Republicans take nine of the 14 seats. In Ohio, Republicans win a supermajority in the State House, despite having fewer votes and take 12 of the 16 congressional seats, despite the votes being split about 50-50. It happens state after state after state, and these maps are so sturdy that it takes a Democratic plurality of 1.4 million votes and renders it completely invisible. There are two main ways of gerrymandering. You can pack and you can crack. The packing involves cramming as many Democrats as you can into one district by any creative means possible, turns the neighboring districts more Republican. Cracking means dividing a Democratic stronghold into pieces so as to lessen its impact. But it's the technology that's available in 2010, really for the first time, that makes these new districts so foolproof. They're drawn with a sophisticated and expensive program called Maptitude, which comes preloaded with reams of census data, economics, ethnicity, religion, specific demographic breakdowns of all types. But then you can add on to this any public record data set. One of the Arizona map makers showed me how it works, how you can factor in election results, voter turnout, and all of this on the level of precincts and tiny census blocks on down ballot elections going back years. Then if you want, you can add in private data sets magazine subscriptions, popular browsing histories by zip code, an entire cloud worth of consumer preferences and buying patterns. With so much information, map makers in 2010 are able to draw precise, perfect boundaries that they knew would be reliable partisan performers for the next decade. They could shift the lines in any direction 
and immediately understand how it would influence the results. These programs are only going to get more powerful next time. The one Maptitude expert told me that by the 2021 redistricting, you'll be able to use all this information to generate a predictive algorithm of how a district is likely to change and evolve over the next 10 years, meaning you'd have a sense of how moving any line would influence the results even further down the road. There are a lot of dangers in this for democracy, yes, but also for the partisans playing cartographic gods. Um, you might argue that the Republicans got too cute, that this has backfired on them in some ways, that they guaranteed themselves control of Congress, but they also generated a Republican caucus they cannot control. For example, when Republicans redistricted North Carolina, they took the city of Asheville, a funky college town, and it had been represented by a conservative Democrat named Heath Schuler, who you may have seen here when he was a quarterback for the Washington Redskins. Um, and they cracked the Democratic vote in two and divided it into two districts, both won by very conservative Republicans. Asheville would now be represented by Mark Meadows, a Tea Party conservative who campaigns on the platform of sending President Obama back to Kenya. He's no more an enamored of Speaker Boehner. It's Meadows who is part of the renegade House Freedom Caucus, a group of conservatives pure in their distaste for deal making and made up almost entirely of Republicans made up, excuse me, elected on these new maps this decade who files the parliamentary move which leads to Boehner's undoing as Speaker. The establishment falls and fared no better this year in the presidential campaign as once presumptive nominees by the name of Bush Christie, Rubio, Kasich, and Walker might tell you. This is what we've done. By creating 400 plus of 435 districts where there is no true competition outside the party primary, members from these districts need only guard their base. Compromise, governing, common ground, all of the things central to the art of politics are the exact things that threaten their livelihood. These congressmen need not talk to the rest of us, and indeed, they are insulated from any response we want to give them at the ballot box. Uncompetitive districts have made the government responsive only to the extremes. They are the reason why the debate within one party looks a lot like, I'm really crazy. No, 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 you are not crazy enough. I am a much purer breed of crazy than you. They are the reason we can't get action on issues where the great center agrees and there's agreement on immigration, on climate change, on Planned Parenthood funding, on guns. This is not going to be easy to undo. It's not a case of winning one election. The system has been knotted up at all different levels, state houses, Congress, state judiciaries. And it can take years and many election cycles for these far-reaching consequences to be cleared away. The Democrats are trying to run the Republicans' play themselves in 2020, but they will have less money, no element of surprise, and the hardest challenge of all, winning on maps so tilted that they've rigged the game, let alone the voter ID laws and restrictions on early voting. We are the only democracy in the world that allows politicians to choose their own voters and draw their own lines. We want our votes to count, our elections to matter, but when our democratic institutions become separated from the popular will, they cease to be effective or democratic. The very constitutional notion of the House as a mirror of popular views comes into question. The idea that nothing happens when a majority expresses disfavor with a party in power is the opposite of participatory democracy. The trendy headline this week is that a Clinton landslide and a Trump debacle could tilt the House to the Democrats. One hesitates to call anything out of reach during this campaign season, except that. You can take this one to the bank. It can't happen on these maps. It would require the Democrats turning their 1.4 million vote advantage from 2012 into something more like a 10 million in 2016. It doesn't work. But if we are going to have four more months of debating whether the Democrats stand even the most remote possibility of capturing the House, 
It's important to understand the recent history which explains why it's a non-starter. Our political conversation around the partisan divide in Congress and how it got this way is too often ahistorical and wrong. The media still thinks we are in the horse and buggy era where both sides do it in the same way. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders barely uttered the term gerrymandering or redistricting in any of their debates. The Democrats are not ready to fight ahead of 2020. Redistricting changed forever after this last census. We have three cycles left to fix it, or we live with the consequences for another decade. I'm sorry that I don't have a happy ending. I am happy to take questions. Thank you. My wife and I worked very hard and have for a long time to get Democrats elected. And over and over, I find that Democrats just play the patsy when it comes yeah. to these GOP tricks. It's not just recently, gerrymandering is one thing, vote flipping by electronic uh, data devices is another, and uh, I doubt that George Bush ever won the 2004 election, but yet the Democrats, I've warned top Democratic leaders over and over, I said, watch out for these tricks. And yet over and over they say, oh, the party will take care of it or whatever, and nothing gets done. Do you have any explanation why the Democrats are such patsies when it comes to these tricks? It's the million dollar question. I don't, I don't have a good answer to it. I mean, I could offer a few theories. I mean, um, the leadership of the party is super coastal and they don't always understand what is happening outside of those coasts. If you look at where the big gerrymandering gains have been done, these are in industrial states, these are in the south, and sometimes when you are representing districts from other parts of the country, you understand what's happening a little more clearly. Um, they were warned about this, you know? I mean, I mean, Karl Rove, writes this piece in big flashing neon lights. So they, they didn't need to have the imagination or the vision to come up with this play. All they needed to do was read the Wall Street Journal and recognize where they had to play defense. And I mean, Jankowski tells me how throughout the fall of 2010, he's running around all these states and he can't believe the Democrats aren't out on the playing field with him trying to you know, even attempt to match what he's doing, and nobody is. They have the field to themselves. Um, I mean, it's a catastrophic strategic failure um, on, on so many levels. And I don't know why it is that Democrats always get elected and think that they can simply reason with the other side <clears throat> um, that their supreme oratorical powers and, and logic um, will carry the day, no matter how many times and how many years it's not the case. Um, it took Barack Obama, I mean, I mean, this Congress and this House stymied him every step of the way. I don't think he mentioned the, the word gerrymandering until his, his final State of the Union address. Um, you know, some of us might have, you know, told him six years ago that this was happening time and time again. And they, they lack the the deviousness or the, or the cunning or the strategic know-how to do anything about it. But, but worse, they don't seem to be planning for it again. And this is going to be a long road back. I feel like they, I mean, Democrats only turn out in presidential years. Um, so it is, is, is easy to have what happened in 2010 happen to you again, but, um, they have to be organized at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. And until you, you build a party that wants to run races in all of those places and is committed 
to winning them. Uh, uh, this has to be overturned legislative chamber by legislative chamber and earning seats back at the table in this process. And they've got five years to do it. Hello. I'm sorry, over. Uh, this process, of, did this process affect the judiciary? Yes. <clears throat> um, not as much as it did legislative districts, but you can follow the money in some of these states, especially North Carolina and Wisconsin, and you can see how some of these Koch brother aligned groups, some of these ALEC aligned groups are, are just as involved in, in funding uh, races for state Supreme Court and all of these other judicial level cases. Um, there are even cases in North Carolina where the judges that they helped elect with the Koch brothers money are ruling on the redistricting cases. Guess which side they came down on. <laughs> how much of this problem do you think can be solved by winning state legislative elections and how much could be solved by direct uh, popular referendums or state ones mandating nonpartisan redistricting or something like that? Amen. Um, if the Democrats want to, if we want to put our faith in the Democratic Party where it might be misplaced, um, their game needs to be winning back legislative chambers. Um, and they have to do so before the next redistricting. Um, but they're, the way that they want to do that involves sinking $70 million into something called Advantage 2020 and trying to do the same thing that the Republicans did last time, you know, go into state races with a lot of money and try to, you know, upend those races. It just, it just brings, it just brings more money into the system, it brings more negativity into the system, it brings more, um, it makes it harder for regular people to, to run for office. It's, 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 it's not a recipe for, for good politics. Um, referendums, on the other hand, are popular. Um, I think that people understand that this is a problem. It appeals to our fundamental sense of uh, fairness, which is something that there's enough good-minded people on both sides of this, on all sides of this, to believe in these ideals that the side with the most votes ought to win, uh, that our elections ought to be about a persuasion and um, building a mandate for solving problems and moving forward. And when you have had referendums in, in red states and blue states and purple states, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, California, they have passed with upwards of 60% of the vote and um, usually they lead to more competitive districts. It doesn't always take the partisanship out of it because it depends on how you constitute a commission. Um, sometimes the commissions just end up being appointed by the same politicians and it just becomes a proxy fight um, and it just moves it into a smaller room but a commission that has specific statutes to follow in their work um, may well be the best way to make this happen. Yeah, the first part of my question is, have you found uh, leaders who, around whom we could coalesce uh, opinion and, and effort uh, in, the, in the process of going around the country? I have not found anybody in the Democratic Party really taking this seriously, and I talk to lots of people. There are, I mean, there were Democrats who in the last decade tried to put up, you know, national redistricting plans. Um, 
John Tanner of Tennessee tried, Martin Frost tried. There, there, there were lots of folks who attempted this and the leadership of the party, even when they were in control, had no interest. Um, seems to me it would be a pretty terrific um, agenda for the uh, Sanders campaign talking about a political a revolution to uh, put its muscle b behind right now. Well, you, I assume you have a website, and perhaps the people who are, uh, who are interested in pursuing this could make uh, use that website as a uh, organizing yeah. tool. I mean, there, there's a great group called Fair Vote in D.C. That, that has, you know, a number of really interesting yeah, plans and proposals around this. Some of them seem a little um, probably radical to people who are used to a system working one way, things like multi-member districts or instant runoff voting, but um, are there the kind of reforms we ought to also be, be thinking about? It sounds like the application and use of technology was a very big factor in what the Republican strategy was. And I'm wondering about the origins of that, you know, how they managed to basically one up the Democratic Party and whether the Democratic Party is getting any traction with regards to technology and the use of it. It's amazing that this happens in 2010 because in 2008 the Democrats used technology so brilliantly in the Obama campaign to, you know, micro target and identify, you know, possible voters, and to, and to get out the, the vote, and to, you know, to really target messaging to specific voters, um, and then they just are completely unprepared for redistricting, and they don't see the challenge in the same way. I think, I think, perhaps because it had never been done before, they just, you know, fall on their on their faces. Um, I mean, Tom Reynolds, who was the Republican in, in charge of their, of their campaign in 2010, says to me that these Obama guys were really, really smart in 2008, and we just plain skunked them, you know, in the uh, state house races. Um, I think that they're aware of the problem now, and that on the on the technology side, they will at least be ready next time. I just don't know if they can win enough elections on these maps to have enough seats at the table to do anything about it, even if they figure out, you know, what these these algorithms are capable of. Hi. It Hi. It looks like uh, from this plan, it's even more evil than than what you are talking about because. To me, it looks like the Republicans always try to reduce the number of voters so that um, they fire up their base and then they can win the election. And this will probably cause even more people to stop voting because they don't see themselves represented and they think their vote is not, um, is not representative. But my, my question is about uh, 2000 election. So Al Gore won, <coughs> sorry, won the popular vote. Was there something similar to this that happened in 2000? Or is it just regular representative democracy? I do not know. Uh, I mean, that was a, a completely different set of maps. So y your 2000 election would have been run on the, on the 1991 maps. And this had not quite progressed to that level of of gamesmanship at that point. Um, in 1991, it's a fairly even split, I believe. I think by 1991, Democrats were actually drawing more lines than Republicans were. They were simply doing it in the old horse and buggy way of you know saving an incumbent, maybe trying to get an extra seat here or there. Um, you know, both parties kind of getting together, being like, "Well, there's a couple more of you, so we want to keep our seats." Um, I mean, even in 2000, um, so, so, so after the 2000 census, the, the 2001 redistricting, in which the, the first election is run in 2002, um, I mean, Democrats hold a small advantage then. I, I think they drew 135 lines, Republicans drew 108. So, so it, was, it, was, it was pretty close still at that point in time with the other ones being um, you know, done by commissions or in, in states where the control was split. 
Um, and then you go to the decade after that and suddenly it jumps to 193 to 44 and you see the strategy at work and the imbalance at play. Yeah, here in Washington, I think we're a little more fortunate because we have the, the Republicans put in their map, the Democrats put in their map, and then you have to decide together which one you're going to it do. It looks like a nice system. <clears throat> and, it, and it worked well. We got, mm -hmm. a, we got one new congressional district and it was, it was just, just about exactly 50-50 Republican Democrat and a Democrat was elected. Though in, in many aspects she's far more conservative than I would like her to be, but, uh, but at least that we, did, um, we did get a Democratic uh, representative um, in, in the House. Um, but our, our um, I don't know what's going to happen with our, with our, our, our State House and Senate because we're just a little bit more Democratic in the Senate and a little mm -hmm. more Republican in the House. I think we're mixing it up with the federal. It's the re reverse of the federal. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned about uh, what might happen on the, on the statewide level here. And, and also, there's, um, we've had a, a Democratic governor, governor for a long time. And uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen this time. I'm not so sure Jay Inslee is going to get reelected. So we'll have to see. That's not really a question. But I, well, I think. I think you're right, though. I mean, because this matters on a state level as well. Um, you look at you look at North Carolina. You, you look at Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. I keep coming back to some of these states because that's it's the most egregious examples, but the state legislatures in these states are just as badly gerrymandered as the Congress is, and there's real r results there. I mean, the, the transgender bathroom bill in North Carolina never passes a fair, co a fair legislature there. Um, you've got something like 60% of the, the citizens of North Carolina opposed to it. Yeah. Um, the the anti-collective bargaining um, deals in Michigan and w Wisconsin don't happen in these states if the assemblies are not so thoroughly gerrymandered that more Democratic votes lead somehow to Republican super majorities. I, I mean, in Michigan, it's only after a gerrymandered excuse me, Republican legislature takes over that they pass the emergency manager law mm -hmm. and it's, and the voters overturn it at a referendum and the legislature votes it back in yeah. and that's how the Flint uh, government is replaced and a Republican emergency manager is put in and the water s supply is poisoned. So this, th this works on a on a state level in the same way it does at the national level. And if you don't have some kind of fairness in these lines, they will be taken advantage of. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure on the, on the state, um, state house and senate level whether it's the same process or yeah. not. I just know about the national one. But I think the lines are, are, are fairly, fairly drawn. Um, but, I'm, but I'm not sure. But I, Given, given the balance in the state and the, in the House and the, uh, Senate, I, th I think they're probably reasonably fairly drawn. I think you're right. Um, this is a little off the subject, but based on your experience, do, do you see a, a lot of uh, abuse in Texas with um, electing judges and judicial decisions? Judicial decisions in Texas would be way out of my... Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, certainly, I mean, certainly Texas has been a, a really important state on the gerrymandering side. It was well gerrymandered by the Democrats for years. Tom DeLay figures out how to take it back by generating a whole lot of money that, that gets him indicted. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it's been a pretty good back and forth in Texas. It's, it's been a real 
it's been a real political fight there. Um, and what you saw in the last go around um, was some of the craftiest usage of the Voting Rights Act that maybe I've ever seen. They got three new seats in Texas and they wanted to give them the appearance of being um, majority minority seats. So they found a college professor in Oklahoma who is brilliant at drawing the lines by using voting um, the records of whether you actually showed up or not. Um, and they drew the lines on this block by block knowledge of whether these specific Hispanic voters in these neighborhoods actually turned out. And they drew three seats that Republicans could win that looked like they were Latino seats, but it's a totally on paper. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty devious place. Uh, Texas, uh, that's what Tom DeLay tried to do, yes, was um, uh, Texas and Georgia, when Republican legislatures took over, said, hey, let's, there's nothing stopping us from redrawing uh, these lines now. Let's, let's press our advantage. So thank you for writing this book and compiling all of this information. I'd been aware of the problem for a while, but you know, I hadn't wrapped my arms around it like you have. I would like to point out that when you go to first aid training and you see someone on the ground and you go to respond, uh, the second step is to point at someone and say, you, call an ambulance. Hmm. And what I'm missing from these books, many of the book tours that come to speak to us here, you know, Greg Pallast amongst others. Great people, yeah. There's no shortage of fuel for the outrage fire. Mm -hmm. And what I'm missing is the nickel summary at the end. What am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And that's what I ask you now is of all of the variations, <laughs> referendum systems for redistricting, if you were king or Trump, what would you <laughs> ask for? What, what would we be fighting for? Because I can't message this. I can't put this into a resolution to go to the party. I need the summary. I need the action steps, not just the outrage. Thank you. The state that does the best job of this, it seems to me, is Iowa, where they have it in the hands of professional, nonpartisan bureaucrats, and they actually are professional, nonpartisan bureaucrats. And there's a culture of civic trust and political trust there that even though both of these sides love to, to, to beat the other side's brains out. And the people of the state and also the politicians take really seriously the fact that they redistrict in this way. I spent a week on the ground there. And like people are genuinely proud of the way that they redistrict um, in Iowa. And it is part of the political culture there. Um, I mean, I think what we have to do is understand that these lines are the fundamental building blocks of our democracy and that we, all of us, have to take them seriously and not consider this to be politics as usual and to find a way to take the responsibility for, for drawing this away from people who can't be trusted with it and to, and to move it back back under our own control. Um, I do think that these commissions can work. And I like that referendums in all of these states attract big majorities of Republicans and Democrats and independents and everyone else um, towards re rebuilding a culture of fairness. But um, I don't think anything changes until you can get the power for doing this away from the people who shouldn't have had it in the first place. I agree. So civic duty based on the Iowa model. I think that's the, the, right. the, 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 that's the best, 
it's the best example of every of any state I found as far as doing this in an honest and democratic way. So please tell everyone you talk to. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Thank you. Redistricting in Iowa ended up in the courts back in the 1970s and the legislature was so embarrassed that they couldn't get the job done that members of both parties got together and said, let's figure out a way to fix this. Um, and they crafted a plan in the 80s that is really, really specific in its statutes. Um, and uh, the lines are drawn by a board and it's made up of, 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 a, of a handful of map makers and, and nonpartisans who the legislature works with on drafting all of their legislation. They're not allowed to take incumbency into consideration at all. They're not allowed to, to take politics into consideration at all. They simply have to draw lines that are equitable and, and fair. Um, and they manage to uh, pull it off. The uh, legislature gets to vote the plan up or down, and if they vote it down, they send it back to the board for another go around. But they don't get to, you know, any extra insight or any extra, you know, chance to offer an opinion on it. Um, and they may like the, the second version less. But it's insane almost that you actually have in Iowa the the state house speaker is a Republican. And he runs the the uh, state legislator version of of the RSLC, and the Senate president is a Democrat, and he actually runs the Democratic version of this. Um, so both of them are are eagerly trying to flip chambers in other states, but would never dream of doing it at home in Iowa, um, and it has something to do with the way that the uh, people there take it very seriously and recognize that it makes their politics better. So at the risk of sounding really silly, um, I haven't been able to quite understand how it is that the redistricting was gerrymandered so much in favor of the Republicans. So my question to you is, is there any recourse for districting in a non-partisan, in uh, any, if, if there's no districting in a non-partisan manner, is there any recourse to this? Not Thank really, um, is the short answer. Um, every state has their own process. And what the Republicans did so well in 2010 was try to understand what that process was in every specific state and then to try to control every member of the board. So say in Ohio there's a five person apportionment board. They set out to be sure that they controlled all five seats. In, in North Carolina, it's the legislature, the House and the Senate who have the only say, even the governor has no say. So they set out to be sure they had both branches there. It's a little different in Michigan, so they had to be sure that they had all of these pieces in place in each of these states. Um, and then once you've done that, you, you don't even have to have the Democrats in the room. Once you have control of all of the people who are responsible for this, you can then force a plan through. Um, there is no Supreme Court ruling that has ever said you can't gerrymander for partisan purposes. Um, the last time this came before the court was in the mid 2000s off of a Pennsylvania uh, case, the uh, Veith versus Ju, I always pronounce this wrong, Ju Bielrer. It's a tough one. Um, and Scalia, in this case, tries to take off the board forever the idea that the court 
could ever overturn a partisan gerrymander. Um, and his side carries the day, except Anthony Kennedy has, you know, a different concurring opinion. But Kennedy says, I'm open to a standard for recognizing and identifying what actionable partisan gerrymandering would be. It's just that I don't see it here. And I don't know, you know, you know someone has to show me what a justiciable standard would be, you know. The Supreme Court knows that pornography when it sees it, but it doesn't know partisan gerrymandering when it sees it. Um, so they, they um, there are a number of cases that are trying to work their way through the system, trying to appeal to Kennedy's uh, plea for uh, something. Uh, there's a case in Wisconsin right now where a bunch of professors believe that they've figured out something called the the efficiency gap, which is designed to show mathematically when a party has taken control by intentionally wasting the other party's votes. Um, and that could reach the court in the next couple of years, but, but that's the, the best chance for a Supreme Court ruling on this. Hi, I know that the red map was so effective in 2010 that it almost seems fruitless in order to try to go for house races in 2016 and 2018. Um, but that almost seems like what the Democrats have done this year, that there are several house races where the filing deadline has already passed and yeah. the Democrats didn't even put up a candidate, let alone just a paper candidate in order to go against Republicans. I don't know if this is an intentional um, ploy in order to try to save money for the 2020 campaign. I can't see that happening, but is that an effective strategy or is that just turning people off in the whole process? And do you have any insight on why Democrats don't put up um, even just uh, a name on a ballot in order to try to run against some Republicans in these races? This is part of the problem. When you don't have competitive districts, you don't have candidates who want to run in them. It's hard to raise money to run in them, and it's a snowball process. Uh, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I mean, no one wants to run a race that they're going to lose, um, and and too many of these districts are just are just are just made so uncompetitive that if you're an ambitious politician, you have no reason t to go out there and spend your your time and fundraise. Um, it's just another way that you know gerrymandering you know poisons democracy. I'd like to return to the theme of Democrats, uh, democratic ineffectiveness. You haven't mentioned the fact that I think would be really important, which is the Democrats should squeal like hell and cry like hell in the press and go to the press and in all our campaigns, talk about the insidious effect that gerrymandering is having and try and educate the American public to the fact that the Republicans do not have a majority and that this whole process has been rigged. And yet, over and over, they say nothing, as you point out. I don't understand that. I completely agree with you. I put that question to uh, Steve Israel, who, who chaired the Democratic campaign, Congressional Campaign Committee, um, and his quotes in the book. I mean, he says, people don't care about that. We've poll tested it. We look like we're a bunch of whiners if we go out there and say that. People want us to get things done, and if we are out there crying about the system and saying it's unfair, they're just going to say, do your job. And I'm not sure he's right. That is bullshit. I think people understand. Yeah. I think that people understand that there is a connection between the rules and the lack of action on issues that matter to them, and that if Democrats did this, it would be effective and important, and I don't understand why they don't. But time and again, they refuse to do it. Uh, Fairvote.org is very, it's a very good group. Absolutely. What was that map program again that you said they used? Maptitude. So uh, you're an alternative media guy. So why, uh, in your opinion, doesn't the mainstream media cover this? Oh, man. <sighs> um, the mainstream media loves 
both sides do it stories. The mainstream media loves, um, it doesn't want to make any judgment on it. And, and they, there's a sense that gerrymandering is too simple to be the answer here. It can't just be gerrymandering. It's got to be something else. We have to come up with a more counterintuitive plan here. You know, no one gets that tenure or retweeted if you're if you're if you're saying that the thing that we all learned about in in civics class is actually the, the big problem. You have to have a you know a better Malcolm Gladwellian answer to it. Um, so you read a lot about the big sort. We have sorted ourselves because Democrats only want to live around other Democrats. Um, and it's not that it's, it's gerrymandering, it's that it's the big sort. Um, except it doesn't hold up if you actually bother to look at the numbers. Um, I mean, Pennsylvania, I think, it pr provides a really great example of this. In, in 2008 and in 2012, both at both years, a Democratic the candidates for the House and the state win with about the same margin of, of votes. In 2008, that they win 12 seats as a result. In 2012, they win five. I mean, what changed? The lines. Um, you know, it's not that hundreds of thousands of people in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh sorted themselves because they wanted to live with, uh, you know, someone who it looked more like they do, uh, the, the lines changed. And sometimes what's right under the nose of, of these people is the first thing that gets missed. Cool, thank you very much for spending your Friday night talking about gerrymandering. <laughs> <laughs>